First at four, a mother's grief and new legal action. We'll talk about a new federal lawsuit connected to the Oxford school shooting and who's being targeted now in court. Drone four, live over the tornado destruction up in Gaylord. The cleanup, a lucky break that led to a quicker response, and now people are showing up to help after the disaster. Let's check in with, check in with Brett Collar. Brett? A solid 10 plus degrees below normal at the moment, but warmer temperatures are on the horizon as is more rain. We're diving into it right now, first at four. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News First at 4 starts now. First at 4, scenes like this from Gaylord. Tough to see, even if you've never been there or have plans to visit. You have to feel for our neighbors to the north after a deadly tornado left all of this kind of destruction behind. Two people are dead, more than 40 injured. Today, the small town about 230 miles northwest of Detroit trying to pick up the pieces and hoping to heal. We've been covering this disaster for three days now, and it's still hard to believe just how much damage was done so quickly. Such was the power of this tornado. Team coverage coming up on First at Four. Paula Tutman reviewing uh, the weather alert system and what to do when you need to find cover. But let's start off with Nick Monticelli, live in Gaylord, who's been looking at this impact of this storm, and he's got more of what we're seeing today three days later. Nick? Yeah, Devin, you said a key word there. You said trying to pick up the pieces. That's exactly what's happening here in Gaylord because how can you pick up something like this? There are 72 lots in this mobile home community, 95% of them, so nearly 70 homes destroyed. And one look from the ground level, another from Drone 4. Take a look at this. This gives you the true perspective, that true shock and awe value when you look at what's really going on here and most importantly, how many lives have been devastated. The cleanup in Gaylord is barely beginning. It will take weeks, if not months, to clear all this. Residents are sifting through what's left of their homes and some, like Lori Beck, are here to help. Just because if it had happened to me, I would want people to come volunteer for me. She drove four hours from the UP. But most importantly, there are still plenty of people hurt, some fighting for their lives. From what I understand, we still have uh, a couple of citizens that are still uh, pretty severely injured, you know, boarding on critical. Despite that, Chief Frank Clays knows how much worse this could have been. Some of that, thanks to luck, the tornado hit during plea shift change. When the wind stopped whipping and the rain stopped, we had twice as many officers to flood the street to help. It, it's nice to get lucky once in a while and, and uh, be in a good position on, on a situation like this. Yeah, and that doesn't happen very often in police work, as you can imagine. I wanted to give you a better idea of exactly how powerful this tornado was. So you saw some homes that were lifted. These mobile homes are bolted and live on top of steel frames just like this one. And in many cases, the steel frames were tossed around. In this case, the home just wiped right off of it. Somebody else's home, someplace they called their home, doesn't exist anymore. And again, Devin, this is just one example of one area. There are businesses, there are more homes on the other side of M32. The cleanup, barely beginning. Yeah. In fact, Nick, uh, we mentioned it's three days since in the overall scheme of things, that's still really early in this process. But uh, give me your impressions of the cleanup so far. You know, what's interesting, too, and you mentioned it's early in the process, right? But when you drive down the main roads in Gaylord, all of that is clear. Yes, you can see the gas station that's been toppled. You can see the oil change that has been leveled and kind of crumbled on top of itself. All that destruction exists off the roads. But there have been so many volunteers. In fact, we met a, a tree trimmer from New Orleans who drove all the way up here just to help. Wow. So many people that came out to clear all of that debris and trees so at least the main trunk lines, the main roads could reopen again so it didn't cripple this town even more. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Nick, we will see you again on Local 4 News at 5. Uh, tornadoes, of course, rare in northern Michigan, but the state as a whole sees an average of 15 of them a year. Do you actually remember the steps you need to take to best protect yourself and your family? Paula Tutman reviewing the state's alert system and has more on what you need to do when severe weather strikes. Paula? 
Yeah, hi, Devin. Hi, everyone. And remember, we're not just talking about tornadoes. We're talking about extreme weather. What a lot of people may not realize is there are National Weather Service offices sprinkled throughout Michigan. Now, these are the guys who know. These are the meteorologists our meteorologists go to as the source of information. They know weather. They know what they're looking at when they see it. And they also know how to survive it. Look at the debris up in the sky, way up high. The first rule of thumb for surviving severe weather is resist the urge to wonder at it, shoot it, or talk about it. We saw that is, hey, did you see that tornado? Because even those 15 to 30 seconds or more can be the difference of surviving, especially if it's a tornado. What people don't realize is you see that tornado with all the debris swirling around. The actual circulation most times is much larger than that. Rich Pullman is with the National Weather Service. At that point, it's about minimizing your risk. Michigan has an amazing weather alert system that gives us information in a number of ways. Cell phone, weather radio, television, sirens, and any combination of those. And everything's programmed. So yeah, we hit one enter button and it goes through the National Weather Service's distribution system and there are a lot of entities hooked up to that and and fans out from there. And if you get the tornado warning, don't guess. Have an in-home plan before you need it. Go low, as low in your house as you can possibly go. Put walls and framing between you and the storm. You want to protect yourself from falling debris and the stairs is the sturdiest part of that basement. Because of the framing? Yeah, a closet, a hallway where the bedrooms are off, or an interior bathroom. Caught outside or on the road, the biggest no feels counterintuitive. Do not hide beneath a concrete underpass. It creates a wind tunnel, so the wind actually accelerates underneath there. And so the debris can still get to you uh, at a faster wind speed. And so it actually is the worst place to be. If you're caught outside, what Rich says is what you can do is look for some sort of depression like a gully. Now you're playing a game of odds. If you've got a blanket or something in your car, grab it. Lay down as flat as you can possibly go. And then also cover your head so that you can try to protect yourself from flying debris. But this becomes a game of odds because a ditch or a gully or even an underground culvert can quickly fill with water. If you can see the rotation and you can safely back up or turn around, move south at a 90 degree angle to drive away. You get out of the hail core and out of any wind threat if you can move to the south. You know, I was talking to one of the meteorologists just a few moments ago. He happened to be looking at his radar at 4 o'clock Friday. He knew what he was looking at. His heart just dropped. Here's the thing. You've got to have a plan. You've got to know. I would do this if I was here. I would do this or I would not do this. You need to have that plan before you need it. Now, the National Weather Service has a wealth of information. They've got it all laid out for you. We're going to put a link on all of our social media platforms so you can go and make your plan so you know what you're going to do and what you're not going to do depending on where you are. Better chance to survive storms and extreme weather. Yeah, so right, Paula, and we're seeing severe weather show up in places that maybe hadn't seen it before, so more people need a plan right. than perhaps uh, have needed one in the past. All right, Paula, we've got more stories come from Gaylord just ahead. At five, new eyewitness accounts of being in the storm's path and the heartbreaking search for things that really cannot be replaced. Then tonight at six, some people had to think fast to survive. We'll show you uh, what they did, where they hid to escape the danger. So a lot more to come, but let's shift to the first forecast. Quiet and cool right now here in Metro Detroit, but things could warm up soon. Let's check in with Brett. Yeah, we are due for some milder temperatures after a solid 10 degrees right now below where we should be this time of the year. Not terribly cold, but it is cool, especially up near the lake here on shoreline, mid 50s at the moment. Normal high this time of the year is 73 degrees. We'll get back close to that in the coming days. In the meantime, still some clouds out there. Kind of a cool thing to see. The upper level clouds are moving from uh, south to north like this, but the low level clouds closer to the ground level are actually moving north to south. So a bit of a shift as you head up throughout the atmosphere. These clouds should start to fade away as we head through the evening, and that will allow numbers to cool off and cool off fast. But relief is in sight. How about 80s in time for the holiday weekend? The trade-off, though, more rain. We'll time it out for you. Coming up in just a bit.
All right, Brett. The heartbreak of the Oxford High School shooting still feels very fresh to the parents of one victim, and they are taking new steps now to fight back. The parents of Justin Schilling have now been added to a state lawsuit along with families of other victims. They've also filed a new federal lawsuit targeting Oxford community schools, teachers and counselors and administrators. It focuses on a suicide prevention program. The suit claims the school failed in its duty to determine if the shooter was a threat to himself or others. For Schilling's mother, the grief is unrelenting. It's been 174 days since he was murdered, and it feels like it was just last week. For me, there will never be healing. There will only be coping. I will never be the same. Of course, four students were killed in the shooting last November, and a fellow student is the one charged in awaiting trial, which will come up in September. Pfizer is pushing ahead and seeking authorization for a COVID-19 vaccine covering younger children. The drug company released research results showing its vaccine offers strong protection for children six months of age up to five years of age. It is a three shot program, but the dosage is one tenth of the amount that adults receive. Pfizer says the vaccine was well tolerated among the more than 1600 children that they had in the trial with a preliminary efficacy rate that's over 80%. So the company's going to send the research to federal regulators for review now later this week.